days. Amen. Amen. So we continue our conversation on wisdom um, this week. In the first service, I started out a teaching, and I'll complete the second part of that teaching. Uh, we're talking about the broad expressions of wisdom, the expressions of wisdom this week. And I said that there are about 12 of them. We had three in the first service. I'll probably maybe do three if I can, maybe do four. And the rest of it, the Holy Spirit will teach you. In Jesus' name, <laughs> amen. Amen. Let's take our wisdom confession, and then we'll take off from there. Amen. It says, repeat after me, I acknowledge God. Say it with your chest. I acknowledge God as the only wise one. I have the Holy Spirit within me. Therefore, I have the spirit of wisdom. I manifest this wisdom, which is from God, practically and with natural excellence. I am wise in my words and actions and I know what to do at all times. The measure of the spirit of wisdom grows as I am taught the word of God this month. In Jesus' name. Say amen to that, please. Amen. You grow wiser and wiser even from this point on out in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let me one step back before I take all the steps we want to take forward today. Last week, one of the things I said, um, especially in the second service, was that the boundaries of wise living, all right, um, there are three of them, but the third one is really my interest. One of the, the third one which I spoke about was that for a person to live wisely, that person must have the ability to accurately diagnose the issues in their lives. Um, and when I say issues, it doesn't necessarily mean that things are not going well for you. Um, I use the word issues to mean that you have been anything less than excellent in returning or in stewardship of anything that God has given to you. Remember, we talked about the parable of the minas. There was a servant that returned 10. There was a servant that returned five. So I said, even if you've returned five, that one of the things you must do if you're going to be a person who lives with wisdom is to take a look at that area of your life where you know it can be better and to accurately diagnose the issue or the root of the issue and take ownership or responsibility for it. That was the key word. Take responsibility for it. And I said that if in your diagnosis you come to conclude that the reason why everything is the way it is is because of factors that are external to you that you have diagnosed wrongly. You've diagnosed what? Wrongly. And I know that that's a hard pill for some of us to swallow um, because the external factors are so vivid. The reasons why things are not great in certain areas of your life, actually, when you look at it, it's very valid. But I'm saying to you that even though the external reasons might be valid, that you must come to a place of internal acceptance of the responsibility that is upon you, and only then can God start to help you. Do you understand what I've said? If you say everything is external, you're going to be stuck in that place, and that's not where you want to be. And what has happened to many people over the years is that they've always had external reasons for why things are the way they are, and they have remained in that place. You remain there for one year, for two years, for five years, for 10 years, and you keep saying it's the external factors, it's the external factors, it's the external factors. There is a need for introspection, all right, for us to look inward and to come to a place of um, understanding as to the role that you have played or not played in the results that you desire. I spoke about this in the first service, but I don't want to talk about Moses. I want to talk about another man in the Bible whose name was Jacob. If you're familiar with the story of Jacob, Jacob went to work for a man whose name was Laban. Somebody say Jacob, and somebody say Laban. Laban was a bad guy, not great. You don't want to have a boss like Laban at all. Very bad guy. Um, and Laban was very, um, he was a fraud. He did everything possible to stifle the possibilities of Jacob. Jacob. Jacob, amen? Something that doesn't like me standing there, all right. Of Jacob, this guy cheated him. 
he turned down his wages several times he was dubious okay in how he acted towards jacob but the external circumstances notwithstanding jacob came out of the house of laban with great wealth do you understand that i'm just trying to let you know that your boss in the office is not your issue i'm trying to let you know that the external things are not the primary issue if you are a child of god that's the difference because once you are a child of God, the Holy Spirit of God lives inside your heart. You cannot carry the Holy Spirit and make excuses. Are you hearing me? So in every circumstance that you come up against, though they are valid issues, though the challenges are real, they exist, you must ask the Holy Spirit, what is it that I must do? What is it that I need to see differently? What do I need to learn about this issue? Until you come to that point, that issue will never change. It will never turn around. Even salvation, remember in the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse number 37, when Peter preached a message, the Bible says that the people were cut to the heart. I spoke about this last week, but in a different context. The people were cut to the heart. So the message came forth. The people were cut to the heart and said to Peter, men and brethren, what did they say? What shall we do? We do. The grace of God that has given salvation has appeared to all men, according to the Bible. It has appeared to all, but it's only those. That's why whenever you tell someone to say the sinner's prayer or, you know, they're giving their heart to Christ, it doesn't matter where they are, whether they're in Saudi Arabia, you must acknowledge that you are a sinner. Are you, are you tracking with me? Imagine that you want to say the sinner's prayer, you want to give your heart to Christ, and you say, Lord Jesus, you know that I live in a Muslim country. That, that is not the issue. Though you do live in a Muslim country, the issue is that you are a sinner. And it's only when you acknowledge your place or the responsibility and take ownership for it is grace released to you. Is grace released to you. Grace is only released. Grace is the enabling power of God, by the way. It's only released to you when you have taken responsibility. If you're still pushing off responsibility, you're going to keep struggling. And this is where many people start drowning because they are trying to come out, but they haven't done the very basic thing, which is what? Take ownership and take responsibility. Can you tell your neighbor, take responsibility? Take your, tell your other neighbor, take ownership. Now tell yourself, take ownership. Take ownership. Be responsible. Amen? Glory to God. All right, so we talk about the expressions of wisdom today, and our anchor text is Ephesians chapter 3, from verse 8 to 12. The premise of my conversation today is that wisdom has many expressions. There are multiple manifestations of wisdom, and you need all the manifestations of wisdom, okay? Wisdom is very, very, um, it's multidimensional, and it's varied in its expressions. And so you can have, it's varied on many levels. It's varied in how it expresses itself. It's varied in also the areas of life of application. So you can have someone who has a lot of financial wisdom, but has very bad wisdom, is not wise when it comes to relationships. Do you agree with me? Do you agree with me? Do you agree that Solomon had wisdom, but he married 700 wives and 300 girlfriends? I hope you know that that is not wise. Uh, some of you are like, Solomon is my mentor. I'm sorry for you. <laughs> In this economy, <laughs> you will be bankrupt. Do you understand? Yeah. So wisdom is multidimensional. Ephesians 3, let's read. The Bible says, to me, Paul writes here, um, and I acknowledge my, my mistake. This is not the right place to start a reading, but just because of time. Who am less than the least of the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to, make no, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. Verse 10 is my, my purpose. It says, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church, by you, to principalities and powers in the heavenly places to the intent now that the manifold wisdom of God that word manifold is multi-dimensional the multiple um, faceted wisdom of God might be made known by you and I to the world and to principalities and powers in the New Living Translation the Bible says that we are called to same same text it says that we are called to display the wisdom of God 
in its rich variety. The key word is variety there. Rich variety. So there are multiple expressions of God's wisdom. Um, um, let's go also to the Amplified and just look at it one more time. Actually, let's do, yeah, let's do Amplified. Um, the Bible says that it is the multifaceted wisdom of God in all its countless aspects, okay? In all its countless aspects might now be made known. So there are multiple expressions of wisdom. In the first service, I spoke about three expressions. I spoke about skill. I spoke about strategy, and I spoke about discernment. Was it? Discernment, right, discernment. All right, so let's go further um, and go to number four. The fourth expression of wisdom that you need in your life and you need to pray for all these different expressions in your life is discretion. Say discretion. Someone talk to me. Say discretion. 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 Now, what is discretion? I'm speaking specifically in terms of wisdom here and your speech. It's knowing what to say and what not to say. Are you hearing me? Knowing what to say and knowing what not to say. So that means that wise speech is not just a function of the content of what you say. It's also, you can also factor in wise speech as what you do not say. It's also a factor of when you say it. I hope you know you can say the right thing at the wrong time. Are you tracking with me? And it becomes a problem. It's discretion. Discretion. So you're not proven wise by what you say alone. You're also proven wise by what you do not say. And for some of us, maybe this is the area of wisdom that we need. You talk too much. You say everything to everybody. Amen. You overshare. Are you, are you with me? Are you with me? You're on Instagram in the morning. This is my breakfast. In the afternoon, living my best life, lunch. Dinner time, just a snack. Why must we know that? Why must we know that? If there was someone chasing your life now, they know exactly, <laughs> they know exactly where to find you. I'm just playing, by the way. But some of us, we need discretion. Not everything should be said. And not everything should be said when it's said. Discretion. Discretion. It's so important. This is what the Bible describes in the life of David. So in the first service, I spoke about David, and I said that one of the manifestations of wisdom that he had was skill. He was skillful in music. But in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and 18, the same verse that we read, um, 1 Samuel 16, 18, NKJV, please. We'll see this about David as, as well when he was described. They said, look, I have seen, this is the description of David, by the way. I have seen Jesse, the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful, so he is skillful in playing. He's a mighty man of valor, a man of war. Now, that is discretion. Prudent in speech. Prudent in speech. And a handsome person. Glory to God. And the Lord is with him. So before a person can be invited to stand before kings, he must demonstrate discretion. You can't go to someone who's of influence and you have loose lips. When you leave there, you take a selfie, then you post it on Instagram and say, guess who I just saw? And just start saying stuff that you should not say. Okay? Discretion is very, very important. Very important. Your ability to guard your mouth, your tongue is important. Actually, it's one of the biggest challenges that people face is that the, the Bible actually says that we will be judged by the words of our mouths. Okay? So you must, some of us, we need to address the issue of discretion. It's not everything that must be said. It's not everything that must be said. Very important. So when you see a person who is wise, they're usually very measured. They don't talk a lot. I'm not saying that they're not friendly, but they're not oversharers. They weigh the atmosphere before they speak. They weigh the people they are interacting with before they speak. Not everything should be said to everybody. And not everything should be said everywhere um, as well. Having discretion is important. Anyone who's a married woman in this house and you've been married for more than two weeks <laughs> can testify to the fact that it's not what you say to your husband that matters. It's when you say it and how you say it. You can say the same exact thing as soon as he walks through the door and it is never going to be received. And you can say it when he's chilling um, having fun and just relaxed and he would say oh let's talk more about it it's discretion having discretion is very important it's a manifestation of wisdom 
Proverbs 11 and verse 12. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not, no, don't put that scripture up. Let's read another one. Proverbs 2.11. I don't want to look for trouble. I want to be, um, let me keep the peace this afternoon. Proverbs 2.11. The Bible says that discretion will preserve you and understanding will keep you. Discretion will do what? Preserve you. It will preserve you. It will preserve you. I don't know who this one is for, but for some of you, I think the Holy Spirit has been warning you already that you are not as discreet as you should be and you don't have as much discretion. All right? God will give you grace in that area in Jesus' name. Number five, expression of wisdom is prediction. I love this one. It's what? Prediction. Prediction. This is the ability to predict, foretell, or anticipate. Now, this comes from the scripture in Proverbs 22, 3. The Bible says that, listen, a wise man or a prudent man will foresee evil and he would hide himself. If everything that happens in your life that is not positive is a surprise to you, you're not very wise. Are you hearing me? A wise man has the ability to see around corners and to anticipate that, hmm, I suspect that something is about to happen. I suspect that if I continue down this path, this will happen and it's not what I want. So the Bible says a wise man will foresee evil and he will do what? He will hide himself. You have to realize that it's two things. This wise man foresees evil and he hides. There are some people who foresee evil and they, they don't hide themselves. They don't hide themselves. Are you married, sir? Yeah, you're married. I know you're married. Please. <laughs> this guy. Please bear me witness in this house, any married people, married men. There are some times you want to have a conversation about something. You foresee evil. <laughs> you know that this conversation is not going to go down well. And you still have the conversation. And then it blows up in your face. And you're wondering, what, what was I even thinking? The Bible says, you know, I always tell people, look, when, you, when something is going to be an issue in your marriage, especially for married people, you knew that this thing was going to be a problem. You could foresee that in the next two and a half hours, <laughs> there's going to be a problem here. But you refuse to hide yourself. And hiding yourself in that situation means that you take a different approach. You don't, you don't hide yourself. If everything that happens that is bad in your life is a surprise, you, are, you, you find yourself in sudden misunderstandings with people, you are not wise. The ability to foresee, to anticipate negative um, consequence and to avoid it is wisdom. Is wisdom. There's some of you, the people that you let into your space, you should be able to foresee that this is evil. This guy should never... <laughs> Should never be on your contact list, let alone be someone you're in a relationship with. Foresee evil and do what? Hide yourself. The ability to anticipate the future based on current events. Because don't forget, you can't see the future. Well, maybe you can if you're prophetic. But you're using current events to discern the future. And based off of that, you hide yourself. That's wisdom. In the Bible, Paul is on a journey. Acts chapter 28 He's on a journey on a ship to Rome. Paul says to the people, look, I perceive that this voyage or this trip is going to be with much loss of life. So let's not go. The people, obviously, he didn't have control over the ship. The Bible says the captain of the ship decided that, no, we're going to go on this ship because they had expertise. You know, sometimes expertise, or you've done it many times, they're sailors, they know what's up. The weather looks good, everything is well. And the Bible says they set out on the journey. Shortly after, the storm of their lives hit. They barely escaped with their lives. So if, if disaster comes upon you suddenly, you're not wise. Don't forget that we have the Holy Spirit within us. Are you, are you, are you understanding what I'm saying? The Spirit of God is within you. He will never let you... Just stumble into a pit without pre-warning you. He would warn you. He would warn you. A wise man foresees evil and does what? Hides himself. Do you realize, if you've ever thought about this, that in the ministry of Jesus, was there any time in the ministry of Jesus that he was surprised? In the Bible. 
whether good or bad surprise, was there any time you found Jesus, Toby, was there any time you found Jesus surprised, shocked in the Bible? No. Why do you think that is? He had a predictive energy, predictive strength. He could tell. He could tell. So one of the manifestations of wisdom that I'm trusting God for, for all of us, and for me too, is that he would have predictive powers. You would be able to tell when OPP policeman is hiding, <laughs> is hiding in front of you and you can't see him. Amen. Because I need that one. I need that one terribly because, my God, they be trying to get me, man. <laughs> predictive powers. You would know. When, you're, when something is about to go wrong, in your, uh, in your place of work, Christians, if they suddenly let you go, suddenly, I mean, you had no premonition whatsoever, something is wrong. I, I don't believe in that. Now, you can say, I sensed it, but I did not act. That's okay. But that you did not sense anything. You just came to work happily on a Tuesday afternoon and they just told you, carry your bags and we encourage you to seek other opportunities. No. No. That's not how we live as Christians. No. So God would have been warning you. You would have started applying for a job. So the day they tell you to go, you say, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I already have another job. Anyways. <clears throat> Prediction. Prediction. Things shouldn't happen to you suddenly, okay? Especially terrible things. Number six, manifestation or expression of wisdom is the ability to build. The ability to do what? To build. This is so good. I hope you know that you're building something. You're building a life. I hope you know that you're building a future. I hope you know that you're building a home. You're building something. You're building a life. You're building a career. Some of you are building a business. Some of you are building a ministry. You are building anything that requires building would require wisdom. Are you hearing me? Because there is, there is a science to building. Building is not the same thing as growing. You understand? Building something is not the same thing as growing or planting something. When you're building something, there is daily effort and every brick must be on top of the, of the next brick and on the next brick and the foundations and the pillars and everything must be set so that it can carry the structure. There is a, an, a significant amount of wisdom that is required when you're building. And all of us are building something. You're building the life of your dreams. You're building the future that you desire. You're building your finances. And so what the Bible says is that it is through wisdom, Proverbs 24 and verse 3, it is through wisdom that a house is built. It's not through concrete and cement or drywall and lumber. It says it is what? Through what? Wisdom. A house is built. Anything that will be built will require wisdom. You want to build a home? Oh, it will require wisdom. The Bible actually says that it is a wise woman that builds her home. A wise woman builds her home. You want to build a career? Trust me, it will require wisdom. So one of the ways we know that someone is manifesting wisdom is that they, are, they have capacity to build. Every week is an improvement on the next. I hope you know that's what happens when you're building. Every year is an improvement on the next to the end that the original vision that was captured is achieved. That's wisdom. But if you, you make progress this year and the next two years you are down and then another four years you go up, then it means that they are not building because what you build is being pulled down and there is no consistency. So the Bible says that it is through wisdom that a house is built. And listen... As you build layer upon layer, the other manifestations of wisdom would come into play. God would be warning you, something is about to pull your house down. So you would, sh you, you would, you would shift from building to protecting for a season. And then when the evil has passed, then you continue to build. This is how everything works. It is how even the church of God is built. 
It is by wisdom. It is by wisdom that a house is built. Laying one piece on the other, every year an improvement on the previous year. Until the thing that you had in mind, the vision that you had for your life, until it becomes a reality and you can hold it in your hands, you're not done building. You're not. Your spiritual life is built layer upon layer. So wherever there is systematic progress, just know that there is wisdom at work. Every time, listen, every time that there is systematic, consistent progress in anything, Wisdom has been deployed there. Wisdom has been deployed. I don't know why I'm talking about marriage a lot today. I think it's just, maybe it's just very relevant. You know, some of us, you wonder how your parents stayed together for 40 years. <laughs> Our generation. After six months, we say, Pastor, I can't do it. I'm done. It takes wisdom to build. Anything that will last will take wisdom. Takes wisdom. The ability to build. Hmm. I don't know what number I am now, but seven. All right. Another expression of wisdom is productivity. Say productivity. Productivity. Now, I'm not just speaking about productivity at a level because I talked about the servant who brought back five, he was productive at his level. Do you remember that? It's productivity at a high level. Anytime you see that the results that someone is getting, he does not, <laughs> he doesn't make sense. Do you understand? Uh, listen to me. Listen. There are sometimes, there is an expected outcome by the law of averages that if you do certain things, this is what your outcome should be. But when you see productivity at a heightened level, when you see unusual results, okay, it means that wisdom is at work. And that's what we saw in the life of Jacob. I started to talk about Jacob earlier. Jacob, in the book of Genesis chapter 30, verse 29, Jacob was a guy who had unusual results. Everybody was doing the same business, but you could never compete with him. Are you tracking with me? Everybody, they have the same thing. The Bible says about Jacob, Jacob said to him, he's talking to his boss, Laban the bad guy, you know how I have served you and your livestock has been with me. It says verse 30, it says, for what you had before I came, it was what? It was little. And it has increased to what? A great amount. The Lord has blessed you since my coming, and now when shall I provide for my own? If you go a, a couple of verses before that, even Laban, his boss, acknowledged. He said, look, I have understood that the reason why God has blessed me is because of your sake. In other words, your hands in my business is bringing a different result. So if you're looking for productivity at a high level where the input might be the same, so if all of us put in the same input, and there's anybody for any reason whose output excels everybody else, that there is a wisdom in what that person is doing. There is wisdom there. Hmm. Listen, you know, when I was in school, I learned this. Let's assume you have two students. Let's assume that you are two students. You're not, but let's assume you are. And you study for five hours, and you study for five hours. The input is the same, correct? Correct? Let's even assume that they have the same aptitude. If this, if this lady does really well, so she gets like an A++ on that test that they were studying for, and he gets like a B-. minus. I know you're an excellent boy. Okay? Like a B-. minus. That means that there is a wisdom that she has that he does not have. You know what that wisdom would be in this particular case? Is that sometimes people study, but they don't know how they understand. So you can study for 10 hours, and your output is little. And you can study for two hours, and your output is yay much, because you have mastered yourself. So I did not know this. I learned this after I had failed my undergrad. Amen. May the Lord have mercy on me. I failed my undergrad terribly, and I realized, look, there is a wisdom I should receive. 
So I learned that wisdom, that I don't learn very well by writing notes and reading. If I come to class, so I, every day I came to school, I came to school without a backpack, without a textbook, I came like this, and I sat. I said, if I get it in class, I don't need to study. But if I don't get it in class, oh God, oh my God, I'll read for hours before I can get it. So I realized that my ears were my best gates. That's a wisdom. So if you see productivity at any level that is heightened, it means that wisdom is being what? Is being deployed there. From now on, you will get unusual results in Jesus' name. Please say amen in Jesus' name. Yeah, you don't have to kill yourself. Amen? All right, let's do one or two more, um, and then we'll call it. I love this manifestation of wisdom. It's called ease. Say ease. Ease. Hmm. I told you that in the first service, the Bible says that the labor of a fool, it wearies him. So anytime you are being wearied, anytime you are stressed out, anytime you are busy struggling with something, it's probably because you haven't figured out the best way to do it. It says the labor of a fool wearies him. The reason why is because they do not know how. So when a person with wisdom is operating, there's a certain level of ease that they manifest. Think about it this way. If you were to drive to a place that you don't know, you only know the general area. So like say someone tells you you should drive to a particular address in Orleans. It's on the east coast, east end rather. And then you say, well, this address is in Orleans, but you don't have a GPS. <laughs> and you don't, you've never been there before. You're going to start driving. You, you head east, so you're heading in the right general direction. But you know you're going to make like 10 stops. You're going to stop here and say, I'm trying to get to this address. Do you know? They say, oh, yeah, you, sorry, you've gone too far. Turn back. Go this way. You will labor. That's what I'm trying. You would labor. You will be weary. By the time you get there, you'll be weary. However, if the person has a GPS, with what? With ease, he will get there. So there is a, a dimension of ease that wisdom brings to you. you. Say, oh, well, everyone is hustling. Canada is a hustle. We are all hustling. You don't have to hustle. Oh, the economy is bad. Interest rates, it's possible, it's true. But I'm telling you that there is an ease that wisdom would bring to you. That some of the things that we labor for would come to you cheaply. Because you have been what? Wise. Because you have been wise. You know, I saw a video... I couldn't find the video, I would have asked them to play it for us, of um, a construction worker <laughs> who was trying to demo a wall, okay, a wall, and he had a, what they call it, a sledgehammer, sledgehammer, and he was, he was beating, <laughs> I felt sorry for this guy, he was striking the wall, and he was getting, you know, he was, there was some progress, or some progress, and all of a sudden, a man who was more experienced came into the room where he was trying to demo the wall, he took a, like a crowbar of some sort, he went to the edge of the wall and did something like this, and the entire wall came down. This guy had been there sweating. He was, getting, he was making progress, but it would have taken him days to finish breaking up that wall. But someone who had more wisdom, experience, we'll call it in this case, the guy came, literally walked in the room, took the thing, separated it at the wall and just pulled it, and the whole massive wall just came down. And that's what happened for many of us. We are striking. We are striking. We are striking. But we've not entered into a grace for ease because wisdom has not been supplied. So you're hustling. You're doing everything possible. You feel like you're over-laboring yourself and you're getting stressed. But you just need to ask God to give you this manifestation of wisdom. It's called ease. It's called what? It's called ease. Hmm. It's called ease. Last one I'll talk about is the ability to solve problems. The ability to do what? To solve problems. Problem solving. As you go through your life, obviously, you would enter into different seasons where you find yourself, you would face something that you call a challenge. How many of you have ever had a challenge in your life at all? Okay. How many of you have never had a challenge in your life? 
Maybe that baby over there. And even that baby, I guarantee you, has had some challenges once or twice trying to figure out where's mom. <laughs> Whenever you find yourself in the bind, let me tell you what happens. It's, it's like someone who's trying to drown. You start struggling. You want to fix it. You run left, you run right, you borrow money here, you beg here, you do everything possible. But what we hardly do is to take a pause and step back and say, Holy Spirit, what should I do? You know, and you find this in the ministry of Jesus. He was never stranded. Never. The need comes up, and the Bible says he himself knew what he would do. So when challenges come up against you, problems, there is always a solution. I, I promise you, if you're a child of God, the Bible says God has already made a provision before the issue arises. Many times it's our inability to see it or maybe we're still in process and our seasons need to align or for us to recognize what God has done. Problem solving. You're faced with an issue in your office. Wisdom can speak to you and solve the issue. They should know you for this. This should be your reputation wherever you are. Like Daniel. Like, look, if there is a problem, call Daniel, he'll figure it out. It's an expression of wisdom. I've told you guys a story before about how there was a time we were getting into a transaction and the deal fell through and we literally had lost 40000 It was a deposit of $40,000 for this particular property at the time. And that night was very rough because I, I, was not, I was not in a good place. I was not happy about the situation. We'd done everything. We talked to the partners. The builder said, no, there's nothing you can do. And they had all the rights and all the legitimacy in the world to deny, to, to, to deny us access to that. So I said, okay, there's nothing to do. And I remember that day I was driving into work. The next day in the morning, I got into my office. As soon as I entered my office, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I said, call the builder directly. So we'd been talking all this while through lawyers. I thought that was going to be more productive, that lawyers know how to threaten people. Apparently, their lawyer was a gangster, who was a more vicious guy. <laughs> the guy was like, absolutely not. The Holy Spirit said, call the builder directly. I'm going, okay. I don't know this builder. So I started doing some research. Sometime around noon, I was able to get in touch with this builder. I spoke to the guy. It was a two-minute conversation, and the guy said, yeah, no problem. I give you whatever you need. Just like that. We would have lost a ton of money for nothing. So problem solving, lean into the Holy Spirit. He has a solution. It's around the corner. It's not too far from you. But you must have the ability to yield to his leading, to take what he is saying and do it. Troubleshooting issues in all circumstances, even in a church environment. Sometimes you come around, there are technical issues. Just take a pause before you start pressing buttons. Guys, <laughs> lady and gentlemen, take a pause. Ask the Holy Spirit, what should you do? You'll be shocked. You'll be shocked. Problems can arise within the home front. Many times, it's our attempt to solve problems that actually makes the problem worse. Because we don't stop and ask the Holy Spirit, what shall we do here? What must I do? I heard a story. It's funny, but it's true. A true life story. Okay. About a woman. And please, I'm not, this is not prescriptive. So please don't try this at home. This is just what happened. This woman had a husband who was always going to the clubs. <laughs> <laughs> on Friday nights, he'll come back from work, he'll take a, a, a quick nap, and then he gets himself ready to go out. And his wife was always fighting him. Why are you going out? This is wrong. You're supposed to be a Christian man. Mm, amen. But his behavior never changed. And one day, the Holy Spirit gave her inspiration. So the guy came back from work on a Friday, he was resting to go and manifest. And this woman asked him, what cloth are you wearing out? She says, he said, this one. She took the clothes that he was to wear to the club and started to iron, press the cloth, and said, yeah, this is going to look really good on you. 
You know the man said, he said, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not interested. I'm not going anymore. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm, uh, he was scared for his life. He was scared for his life. But she'd be fighting him the whole time. It didn't work. Do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? Problem solving sometimes requires what? Inspiration by the Spirit. Wisdom. The man repented. He never went again. Gave his heart to Christ immediately. <laughs> if it was you, would you go? Would you go? Some of you are like, Pastor, what are you talking about? We've never been to the clubs before. The devil is a liar. Let's pray. Bow your heads. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I give you praise. Can you ask God for whatever spoke to your heart? Give me grace, the ability to build. I think that's a critical one. The grace to solve problems, complicated issues, anytime and anywhere they arise. Make me a problem solver. It's a manifestation of the spirit of wisdom. Discretion. Help me to be more measured. Pray for yourself. The grace for productivity at a very high level. Unusual results. Unusual results. Unusual results. Unusual results. Unusual results. Give me the grace, the ability to build. Help me to build my life. Help me to build your house. Help me to build the vision that you've committed to my hands. Help me. The picture is clear, but how to go about it? Help me. Give me predictive powers. I will not be taken by surprise. I will foresee evil. I would have the presence of mind to hide myself. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ. Spirit of the living God, we ask for your help. And while we pray, if there's anyone in this house as well, you want to give your heart to Jesus, you have not surrendered your life to God. You know that you don't have a good relationship with God or your relationship with God is not existent. And you're in this house, it's possible that you're here. That's why we're here. So wave your hands at me wherever you are so I can pray with you. Um, I need to see you so I can pray with you. Does anyone at all? Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory be to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Father, Lord, I thank you and give you praise today for your grace, your mercy. Thank you, Holy Spirit, because you are the spirit of wisdom. Heavenly Father, I pray for every single person under the sound of my voice that there'll be an impartation of that spirit of wisdom. We will know what to do. We will know how to do it. We will know what to say and what not to say that there'll be productivity at a high level, there'll be a grace to solve complicated problems, whatever the issues might be, in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Um, see some of you on Friday at Carlton, some of you on Saturday at Young Ministers Retreat, the rest of you on Sunday in church. God bless you.